Now, uh, he just signed a new 10-year deal with ABC. The guy is as crisp. He writes his own copy. You know, Brian, I'm one of the, I'm the only national television anchor man who writes his own copy. And I'm bragging about it and, you know, stuff me if you think I'm an ego guy. But Harvey writes his own copy. He goes in at 4 in the morning with a typewriter and bangs it out. I respect that. Let's go to Missouri. Is it Columbia or Columbus? Caller? Columbus, Mississippi. Columbus, Mississippi. I'm sorry. Right where Mississippi. the university is, right? Uh, that's uh, Mississippi University for Women in Columbus. Uh-huh. Across the way is Starkville, and that uh, is Mississippi State University. So there. Listen, I have a, uh, I, I guess, question or statement. Uh, I really respect Mr. O'Reilly. I, uh, I read his book, uh, and I uh, yeah, listened to his show. And uh, I must say that I, in times past, I have run for public office before the Mississippi House of Representatives as a Republican. And I uh, attended the Republican National Convention in 1988 and so forth and bought into the whole conservative uh, Republican line. No one wanted to be a Republican more than I did. I'm a black American. And no one wanted to be a Republican more than I did. I believe in, tr in the traditional values and uh, just about uh, the whole uh, hook, line, and sinker. Uh, the, uh, just about everything that the uh, Republican Party and conservatives espouse. But I have to tell you, but living in Mississippi, I don't know what you're, I mean, where you, where you lived before. Uh, you know, I've had J.C. Watts come down here to campaign for me and all this. Uh, you have no idea the struggle it is. I mean, you mentioned earlier that uh, people, uh, black Americans, should uh, not dwell on the past and then go forward. And <laughs> let me tell you, man, I tried, I preached that, and I, you know, that was my... But if you live today, the, the, the critical now today, you have no idea what people go through on an everyday basis. If you're black, you've got to be twice. And this is, uh, I'm not ranting, I'm not, I'm not, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, look, I, I understand what you're saying. And I, and, I, and I said in my initial comments, I'm not diminishing the problem. I know it exists. There are, there are a number of solutions to the problem, though. Number one, you can leave Mississippi and you can go to Los Angeles or Chicago or New York or Miami or someplace else where the attitudes are a bit more tolerant. That's number one. Number two, you can see it as a challenge. You can see it as a, um, I mean, I'm not going to get into some of the things that I went through in my childhood, but they weren't easy, but they made me stronger, and I overcame them, and I always looked at it that way. I didn't feel sorry for myself. but. For black Americans, you have to make just choices in this country. It's harder for you, no question. It's harder for you. But you can do it. It can be done. And one of the things that you have to do is develop a very thick skin and ignore a lot of the little stuff that doesn't matter. And then concentrate on the big stuff. If you get held back because of your race, there are many, many attorneys that you should call immediately to help you. But I will say this. If you're in a situation, whether it be Mississippi or Alaska or Montana, where you believe that there is systemic discrimination against you in whatever area you're in, get out of there. Get out of there. Don't fight that battle there. Fight it somewhere else. The lead and only editorial on the Wall Street Journal this morning has the headline, Yes, comma, Indict Clinton. You have some strong things to say about Bill Clinton in your book. What do you think of the idea of indicting him? I think you have to indict Bill Clinton, and I'm not saying this out of any uh, ideology or rancor. Um, you know, Mr. Clinton's a charming guy. Personally, I think he'd be a great guy to hang around with. But you can't have the President of the United States committing perjury, no matter what the case. So if it's about sex, if it's about money, if it's about baseball, if it's about crickets, it doesn't matter. The man lied under oath. He lied before a grand jury. He lied to the nation. He's got to be held accountable. Now, some people say impeachment was enough. And I, I, I've strongly considered that view. But Mr. Clinton is not repentant at all. His comments in Esquire magazine, his comments to the press is, I'm a victim. They came after me. There was no reason for this. He doesn't see the wrong that he did or the damage that he caused. So I think if you are a nation where equal justice for all is one of our most important tenets, then Mr. Clinton's got to be indicted on perjury and obstruction of justice. He did some terrible things to try to save his own butt. That being said, 
right after that indictment, if I were President-elect Bush, I would pardon Mr. Clinton. I don't think the country needs another circus trial, and I think just the indictment would send the message to everyone that no one is above the law. On this snowy morning in Washington, it's begun snowing here for the first time in a long time. Uh, Bill O'Reilly is in New York in the Fox Studios down there on 6th Avenue. He is a native, as we said, of Levittown, New York. He went to Marist College where he got a history degree, Boston University where he got a master's in broadcast journalism, and the Harvard University School, Kennedy School of Government where he got a master's in public policy in 1996. When did you marry? I married in 19... Oh, boy, I better get this right. Um, I married in 1997. And how old is your child? 20 months old. And the name? Madeline. The name of your wife? Maureen. We go next to Los Angeles for Bill O'Reilly. Hello, Los Angeles. Hello, Provincetown, Massachusetts on the Democratic line. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, I was wondering um, exactly what about 3,000 Americans coming to an American resort town is an infestation? Okay, now that's a good question. Um, here's the deal on this. I worked in Boston for many years. Um, and Provincetown, where you live, is a beautiful place on the tip of Cape Cod. As you probably know, that town traditionally was a fishing village. A very small town, uh, a lot of Portuguese there, some Irish, you know, mixed. All of a sudden, in the late 70s, it became a resort town like Key West, for gay people. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with it. This is America. You guys want a vacation someplace? Got, and, and ladies, you have the perfect right to do that. However, with all of these people descending on a very tiny town, in great numbers in the very permissive early 80s when I did the story for CBS, people who lived in Provincetown with families were shocked at what was going on. We had footage of I'm not going to describe it, but stuff out in public that if a 10-year-old saw it would be very disturbing. CBS would not run the story. That was wrong. That was deadly wrong. I interviewed gay people. I interviewed straight people. I interviewed a lot of people. It was a fair story. should have been told. That's it. Provincetown, your response? Well, um, historically, you're quite wrong about that. Um, historically, uh, Provincetown has been a welcoming community since the turn of the century. Um, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, 70s, 80s, they have welcomed people to this town who may not fit in in the rest of the uh, country. I moved from Michigan where I couldn't be open about my lifestyle, but here my neighbors don't care. Gay people serve on the, on the selectmen, they serve in the in the uh, uh, volunteer fire department. They serve in the volunteer rescue squad. We have gay teachers. We have gay doctors, gay veterinarians. The people of Provincetown did not, weren't shocked. They're shocked by behavior of tourists, yes. But we're not shocked by having gay people in our midst. Or All right, well, whatever it is, I had plenty of people on camera who were shocked. And that's all I'm saying. I'm not making any judgments, as I said. You guys got a right to go and do whatever you want to do, and I wish you a very happy life. And that was 18 years ago, by the way, so I'm sure the town has assimilated into what it is today. I like Provincetown. Would you tell us uh, a little bit of the story of your difficulty with the producer of Nightline? <laughs> um, all right. You want to know that, Mr. Lama? I'll tell you. I mean, there are a lot of terrible, sleazy, power-mad uh, people working in uh, the news business, and uh, one of them was uh, the executive producer of Nightline when I was at ABC News. And uh, this guy tried to set me up. I don't want to, I mean, I don't want to go into great detail on this. It's in the book and uh, it's a good story. But uh, suffice it to say that I was sent out on a story to cover it. Um, I was taken off the story by this guy for no reason at all. Good Morning America then assigned me to the same story because they knew I was getting job by this guy. Um, I was working for GMA, and then the Nightline guy calls me back and, and tries to tell the uh, bigwigs at ABC News that I refused an assignment, which is a firing offense at the network. I taped this guy, unbeknownst to him, because <laughs> I knew what a terrible, terrible person he is. Um, and the tape that I had 
was the only thing that saved my butt. Where is this terrible person today? He was fired from a major news organization about six months ago. He is on the beach, as they say. His name isn't possibly Rick Kaplan, is it? I have no comment. Miami, Florida, next. Democrat, go ahead, please. Hello, Mr. Riley. Yes, sir. How you doing? My name is Felix. I'm, I just want to tell you, I mean, I'm glad someone had the guts to come forward with some of the topics that you talk about. Thank you, sir. Like yesterday, you talked about the drugs in clubs, you know, that, that drug in public. That's an awesome subject because, I mean, I love to go into clubs. I love the music, but I have to tell you that it's sick to see, you know, to see the things that you see in Miami in the clubs. I mean, 90 of people are doing drugs in front of everybody. You know what the worst thing is? I taught high school in Miami for two years in a, in a uh, ghetto area called Opalaca, which is probably the crack capital of Florida. And, you know, I don't care about the disco divas snorting cocaine. I got to tell you the truth. I don't care about them. But the kids, the kids of America should not be subjected to hard drugs or marijuana or beer or anything when they're eight years old. You know, let's give the kids a break. And let's stop with this victim nonsense and that everybody has a right to do their own thing. You don't have a right to be publicly intoxicated in this country. That's not a right, all right? You don't have a right to corrupt children. You don't have a right to have behavior that is leading to the disintegration of inner cities. You don't have that right. You don't have a right to get in a car intoxicated. You don't have a right to abuse your children because you're blasted out of your mind. Society's got to get tougher on this stuff. Society's got to hold the people accountable who are using this stuff. We're not going to stop it at the border. We're not going to send billions to Colombia and get anything out of that. That's just stupid. We've got to stop being pandering to the drug consumer lobby and start saying, look, you hurt somebody under the influence of drugs, you're going to pay a price. And that price is coerced rehabilitation, um, confined con uh, coerced rehabilitation. Let me quickly check your meter on a, a number of things that are going on in and around this town and just see where you come down on it. Mrs. Clinton's $8 million book contract. You know, I mean, Newt Gingrich got all kinds of hell when he signed his deal with uh, Rupert Murdoch, and uh, Mrs. Clinton gets nothing. You know, we don't hear anything about that. That's hypocrisy. Um, the House of Representatives passed a bill, uh, passed the, uh, uh, not a law, but passes rules that you can't take advance money to the Senate. You can. Mrs. Clinton is an opportunist. I think anybody looking at her objectively knows that. She's going to do what's good for Mrs. Clinton. You know, eight million bucks up front, she gets the house in D.C., she gets uh, a bunch of other stuff. What can I say? you got to make your own mind up about Mrs. Clinton. Front page USA Today, Mrs. Cheney going back to work, going on boards, the American Express Mutual Funds Board, the Reader's Digest Board, going back to the American Enterprise Institute, should she be allowed to do it? The first time it's ever happened, supposedly, with somebody that's a spouse of either a president or a vice president. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you can, in America, you can say to somebody's uh, spouse, hey, you can't work because your spouse is a, a public servant elected official, so I don't have any problem with it. How about the transition teams, the 474 people here in town, come, a lot of them come from industry, that are serving on the transition teams for the agencies in which their particular companies might be judged later, like a, yeah, yeah well, look, I mean, you got all, look, Washington, I stay out of Washington as much as I can. I got to come down for the inauguration. I'm going to raise some heck down there for three days when I come down. Uh, you know, it's all scratch my back. I'll scratch yours. Give me money, and then I'll do you a favor. I mean, who are we trying to kid here? I mean, Washington is a money town. Everybody thinks it's a power town, but money is power. And the guys who have the jack get special treatment, and they get in, and they, they get to do things that working Americans can never do. It's wrong. It's been going on far too long, and I hope that McCain-Feingold can clean this up a little bit. Hamilton, Montana, Democrat for our guest, Bill O'Reilly. Bill, first I'd like to say uh, thank you. I'd like to get your opinion. Uh, first, I want to agree with you that Bill Clinton should be indicted but I would also like to know, um, in the last election being so close, do you feel or what is your opinion on people agreeing with the economy the way it's been for the last eight years, no matter who or what they give the credit to, uh, being a factor in why the last election was so close? Um, well, look, the biggest myth in the world is that President Clinton had something to do with the economy because he didn't. American workers and American ingenuity uh, came up with tremendous high-tech um, 
improvements and uh, innovations, and that drove the economy.